have devastated our state and our nation. We've seen things like this happen elsewhere in the world, but there's not a person in this room who ever thought that that would visit their community in the state of Connecticut. But as we try to heal, a search for solutions has already begun. I will use all the powers of this office to help advance efforts aimed at preventing more tragedies like this. President Obama and Governor Malloy have said that things must change, but what and how? Is America ready for a real conversation about the role of guns in society? In the next hour, we'll talk about handguns and high-powered rifles, background checks and Second Amendment rights, how these issues affect our educators, our law enforcement, and our cities. And we'll see if Washington is ready to tackle an issue it's long ignored. We want to hear your voice as we start a town meeting about guns. I'm John Dankowski. I'm the host of Where We Live on WNPR. I'd like to welcome our audience here to the Chase Family Studio at CPTV. And I want to welcome in our panelists first. Patricia Saccone is superintendent of the Connecticut Technical High School System, which serves just under 11,000 high school students and adults. On January 1st, she'll be transitioning to a new role as superintendent of Westbrook Public Schools. Welcome. Thank you. Next to her is uh, Pedro Segarra, the mayor of the city of Hartford. He's been working to combat gun violence in his city. His father and two childhood friends were killed as a result of gun violence, and we welcome Mayor Cigar here. Thank you. Thank you for having this discussion. Robert Crook is executive director of the Coalition of Connecticut Sportsmen. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Next to him is Ed Peruta. He's director of Connecticut Cary. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. And Richard Slotkin is Olin Professor of American Studies Emeritus at Wesleyan University. He has an expertise in the cultural history of violence and gun usage. Welcome. Thank you. I want to start with you, Professor, and I, I want to get a sense of why Americans love guns so much. Well, uh, just speaking as a, a cultural historian, what I can talk about is the way in which our values and beliefs that come out of our history shape the role of violence and guns in the culture. Three basic points. First, that American civil society, as it developed, is exceptionally violent when compared with other uh, advanced societies, and it's shown really by our homicide rate which is exponentially higher than that of other advanced societies and also by the number of, of uh, mass shootings. And the second point would be that guns play uh, uh, a unique role in our culture in general and in violence in particular. That handguns are uh, the, the, the weapon of choice in American shootings, but basically for, uh, between 47 and 53 percent of American households uh, uh, have guns, so guns are there. And the third point I would want to make is that in recent years, we've seen a, uh, the g the guns become a political symbol uh, uh, in a way that heightens people's uh, desire for guns and for what I would call firepower in excess of real need. So uh, every culture has its, um, its codes and practices of violence. What differentiates America from uh, countries in Europe is that uh, we give a much broader license to the private or personal use of violence, whereas the history of Europe, uh, collective and, and, and state-sponsored violence is much worse than it is here. Our individual murder rate is what, uh, is what uh, distinguishes us, and which also creates a kind of feedback loop that stimulates the demands uh, for private weapons. Well, I, uh, I'm wondering, sir, yeah. could you maybe define what you believe the debate is in America right now around guns? Because over the course of this week, I feel as though it's shifted somehow. W what, are the, what are the two sides here, and, and what are they fighting for? Well, uh, uh, I think that there's, a, there's a, an argument uh, a, a, a between what, what's called gun rights and uh, uh, the desire of people to be protected from gun violence. And this taps into a whole complex of, of uh, political and, and, uh, and cultural issues. I, I guess I want to say a couple of things about that. First, that you have to take into account the fact that since the late 19th century, America, there's been a lot of guns out there in America. So that the, the, the desire of some individuals for self-defense weapons is not a crazy notion. Uh, it has a kind of rationale uh, to it, although the more guns there are, 
uh, the more you need guns to defend yourself. And there is what I call a, a feedback loop. But we've also gotten into a situation where people have attributed to guns a power that they don't really have. And I'm thinking here about the notion, uh, which I've heard uh, some people uh, talking about, that uh, American freedom depends on the existence of guns in private hands. And it seems to me that this is a profound mistake about the nature of guns and about the nature of uh, American society. What makes us work as a society is that we're a nation of laws and uh, of uh, uh, laws that protect individual rights. If, in fact, your civil rights depended on your personal weapons, then your civil rights would end as soon as you meet somebody who is more willing to kill than you are and has better weapons than you have. Mr. Peruta, do you have a response for the professor? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I believe the last time a foreign country set foot on American soil was in World War II in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, Hawaii wasn't ours yet. It was a territory. Um, and, you know, I, I am somewhat familiar with history, and there's been a lot of repressive governments in Europe where guns are outlawed, guns are taken. Uh, that hasn't happened here. And I would only say that if we could go back to December 8, 1941, and be having this debate about have guns, not have guns, the entire West Coast, thinking that the Japanese were coming ashore, would have said, you're not taking mine. But, but do, you, do you have guns? Do you love guns? Because well, you're worried about an oppressive regime from no. overseas? What is, no. it, what, My, what is it you're I, worried about? First of all, and I, 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 I prepared something, and I think it's appropriate for me to do this. That's fine. Um, first and foremost... I'd like to offer my sincere, heartfelt condolences to the family members and individuals who lost their lives in Newtown, Connecticut last Friday, along with the students and staff of Sandy Hook who suffered through the horrific incident at Sandy Hook Elementary School. I would also like to thank the first responders who were initially summoned to Sandy Hook Elementary School in the initial minutes and the days following the event. For the record, I am Edward Peruta and I am here at the invitation of CPTV and WNPR representing Connecticut Carry, and would like you to know that I am not an individual that loves firearms. Mm -hmm. I am simply one of over 170,000 current individuals in Connecticut who truly believes in the right of self-defense as set forth in our Constitution and the Federal Second Amendment and obtained a pistol permit to carry pistols or revolvers for self-defense. You and I talked on the radio one time. We did. Um, I suggested after that interview that there needed to be a dialogue. Uh, I presented myself to people and tried to get that dialogue going. Uh, there were people that weren't interested. Um, I'm not, I'm not hard-nosed on anything. I'm willing to, to, to listen to reason, to, uh, to discuss, but I'm just one person. Well, and, and, what and I don't like to, love yeah. firearms. I have firearms for self-defense, yeah. but I don't love firearms. I don't collect them. I don't, you know. Well, it, what we'll do is, and we're going to broaden out this discussion a bit and, and give us all a chance to talk. I, I do want to go uh, to Senator Richard Blumenthal, who's joining us from Washington uh, now. Uh, he's starting to be part of a conversation that is happening in Washington, a conversation that is in some ways just as difficult as the conversation that, that we're having here. Uh, Senator Blumenthal, welcome to our program. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to be with you. We had a few technical difficulties here, but uh, thank you for having me in this way. Uh, Senator Blumenthal, perhaps you could talk to us a bit about what conversations you've had with your colleagues in the Senate in the last couple days about new legislation that, that you and others may propose around uh, guns and ammunition? There is a growing movement within the Congress, including people who really may be differing somewhat with their past positions, to do something about gun violence in this country. And doing something is the refrain I've heard again and again and again as I've spent the last better part of a week in Newtown, but also from across Connecticut and across the country. And what my colleagues are hearing is very much the same from their constituents. You need to do something. And that will include probably an effort to ban assault weapons, 
to stop the large capacity magazines that often accompany them. The assault weapons really were designed to kill and maim human beings, designed as a military weapon, and have been adapted in, for civilian use. And I have a history on this issue because I advocated and then helped defend, when it was challenged in court, our own gun law that prohibits assault weapons of certain kind. And then also the possible efforts on mental health, better background checks to discern people who have mental, may have mental health problems. Right now, only about 60 percent of all the gun sale in the United States actually involve background checks. And there may be an effort also to improve those background checks by making them more comprehensive and effective. And of course, along with mental health outreach, the idea that perhaps video games, entertainment should be given some scrutiny at least, although we can't control them because of First Amendment considerations. And likewise, I think my colleagues who are active in this area also respect the other constitutional amendment that's involved here, the Second Amendment. But to answer your question very directly, I'm working with Senator Feinstein, who was the author of the first assault weapon ban for the federal government. And that ban, of course, expired, but we aim to introduce it on the first day of the new session. And I'm proud to be leading on behalf of Connecticut. Our entire delegation has been very supportive on this issue, but well, I've reached out to other senators, colleagues, S S Senator Blumenthal, who are I, I, going to be very important. I, I know that tomorrow we're going to hear from the National Rifle Association uh, in a statement, and I know that a number of the senators that you're uh, speaking with are members of the NRA and are talking about their positions on this. I want to quickly bring into the conversation, um, uh, Mr. Crook. I'd like you to maybe respond to Senator Blumenthal and, and talk about where you think your organization might be willing to to go to help us solve some of the issues that we're all talking about right now. Are you willing to, in your position, work with, say, someone at the state capitol on some changes to Connecticut gun laws that might make some people feel safer? You know, we already started the discussion amongst the... I, I was asking Mr. Oh, Crook, and I apologize. Yeah, yeah I, I, we're always amenable to, uh, to discussing uh, gun laws. Uh, the problem, the pro where the problem lies is what Senator Blumenthal just said. Uh, we have an assault weapon bill in the state of Connecticut, and you could say it's worked or it hasn't worked. Uh, but from our perspective, it does nothing. It hasn't stopped anybody from, uh, uh, essentially, from uh, buying uh, so-called assault weapons. And sometime in this debate, I'd like to have someone define what an assault weapon is. Uh, because what the media is calling it, it is not. Uh, secondly, uh, we see three things coming out of this. We see, one, the, the issue of the assault weapon ban, and we will oppose that. Uh, we opposed it uh, back when the senator was up in the legislature. Uh, it hasn't done anything in Connecticut. Uh, uh, there's no de definitive proof that it has done anything. The feds got rid of it because it didn't do anything. The second thing is, is uh, mental health. Now, I am no expert. I know very, very little about mental health, but that has to be addressed, and I agree with the senator. Uh, the third thing is uh, uh, school security. Uh, that also has to be addressed, because all three of those things come into play, uh, either positively or negatively, in Sandy Hook. And we'll talk about school security in a moment. I know, uh, Mayor Cigar, you wanted to jump in. So uh, maybe if you can enter into the conversation as someone who represents a city, a city where there has been historic gun violence, something that you're trying to stop, uh, not of the type that we have seen uh, at Sandy Hook. Uh, maybe you can talk about what the mayors of, of the country are doing. Uh, perhaps maybe we can modify the definition of an assault weapon to include smaller revolvers and guns. Those are the weapons that have tragically taken most of the lives of the young men and women and people in my city, in New Haven, in Bridgeport. So we do need to have a conversation about handguns as well. Uh, that conversation might happen at our state level, but for now I think that the mayors that I spoke to, and we had a meeting as recently as last night between Mayor Finch, Mayor DeStefano, uh, we have been in contact with Mayor Bloomberg in New York. 
to support our senators and our Congress uh, in an immediate ban to assault weapons, an immediate ban of high capacity magazines, uh, in making sure that we close the loopholes in gun sales to make sure that people don't migrate out of Connecticut or other states in which they are tougher gun laws to acquire these type of, of, of guns uh, through these uh, loopholes. Uh, but we do need to have some action also at the state level. We need to make sure that we uh, don't have uh, uh, use of interstate uh, or internet sales uh, to obtain weapons. We need to make sure that we do a better job at screening the people who are uh, going to be given uh, the right to, to possess a, a gun. So there's a lot to do at both levels, and we're totally supportive of our senator. Uh, this time, hopefully, one important thing would happen, and that is that the community, the communities will get involved in a large call to action to make sure that we avoid tragedies in the future. Senator Blumenthal, I'm wondering, as you listen to, to Mayor Segarra speak, uh, he and many other mayors across the country have been plagued by a different type of gun violence than this gun violence. And I understand uh, what we're talking about now and why we're talking about assault weapons, why we're talking about these types of rifles. But at the end of the day, as Mayor Segarra says, most of the crimes that are committed in cities happen with small handguns, and they happen with small handguns that are not purchased legally. How can you tackle these issues at the same time you're tackle, tackling these other very important issues? And is that something that's going to be on your plate as you and the vice president, the president, begin work on this? Very much so, John. And I'm so glad that you gave me the opportunity to respond because Mayor Segarra makes an excellent point. There is no single solution, no simple cure-all. And, you know, a great many children are victims of drive-by shootings where they happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and the bullet hits them instead of someone else that it may be intended to hit. And so the problem of violence may affect individual children. In this instance, Newtown, it really resulted in the mass execution of 20 beautiful, wonderful children, as well as some very dedicated professionals. And we should really celebrate the courage of the teachers and the principal who were involved in trying to protect their children, placing themselves in between the shooter and their children. But he is right that gun violence, and especially stolen guns, mm -hmm. that escape the enforcement mechanisms that we've established are very much a problem. And you know, one point that we haven't covered here, but I sure. think it fits Bob's point, is better enforcement of existing laws. I am a guy who's been in law enforcement. I was state attorney general. I was a federal prosecutor as United States attorney. I've done both criminal and civil. The best law in the books and the best new laws will be dead letter unless we provide the resources and support to the Hartford Police Department, to our state police, mm. to the federal agencies, at &F, that are responsible for enforcement. I, I, and and I'd mental like to, health, it, couldn't it, agree more. And, and before we get to mental health, because I do want to speak about some of these other issues, I do want to go to the superintendent, because I think Robert Crook mentions a few things, and one of them is school safety. Mm -hmm. And from your standpoint, talk about that and how you believe guns play into the issue of school safety. Yes, absolutely. Um, our schools are safe. Our schools practice safety. Our schools have safety plans. They have things in place, trainings for students and staff, administrators, um, you know, uh, have pre-planning, pre-event things, what would happen if you had a report. Um, and these things are drilled and practiced. There are state laws and there are federal laws around how many drills we have, how many things we do monthly. So the eye is on the safety. And, but what happened in Sandy Hook, what is happening as the mayor suggests that day to day we deal with these violence issues related to guns. I am the superintendent of the technical high school system. That's a statewide system. There are urban schools. Our school in Bridgeport is reeling on a day-to-day -day basis with issues that come up related to single gun, single person violence. We've lost students, we've helped students. So what schools are doing are making themselves as safe as possible what also is a part of that that is absolutely critical is the integration 
of what's going on in school life. What is school life like? Are students connected to adults? Are adults connected to students? And are adults connected to one another? Are they places that are nurturing? Do people know one another, watch out for one another? And really, in, in preparing for the aftermath of the tragedy in Sandy Hook, um, that's what we were doing on Monday morning. We were talking about the next steps, sadly, um, observing one another, reporting things that we've seen that may be of concern to those who are equipped to handle them, and trying to get back to normalcy. I, I, I am actually joined by a school safety officer here, Chris McKee. Uh, is here from, from Windsor. Hi, uh, welcome, sir. I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if you can talk a bit about, from your standpoint, what school safety means. And, and again, as, as, as I asked the superintendent, how guns play into this? Because I, I will tell you, in this last week, I've heard from more than a few people who say, if teachers or more people at the school were armed or trained with guns, something like this wouldn't happen. That's, that's not one or two people, but many people have been saying this. What do you say to that? Uh, well, I would have to agree with the superintendent. I think that schools plan for as, as best they can. I think that beyond the, the relationships that the superintendent is mentioning of adults with students, it's relationships between the schools and the, the governments, the, the cities, the towns, their police departments. Um, I think that if you, you can make that argument, uh, you know, the arguments that are made about if the principal was armed, could, would this have happened or could someone stop the violence? Um, and we've had a lot of conversations in our school system, obviously with students and trying to allay fears. And I think that we typically bring up, you know, the, the analogy of arming pilots, for example. And in theory, it, it may be a possibility. I, I'm not familiar with any research or other locations that have this. However, um, in a situation such as Sandy Hook or other where there, there's the stress and the obviously the educators are a very special breed and their focus is on their kids and their focus is on taking care of their kids, would an armed person other than a police officer or some type of security person there be able to handle all these responsibilities would that be their focus would they be able to act under the stress i don't know because you know the police officers we have to go to the range repeatedly for our certification we have to do it under stress we have to run do push-ups have sirens in our ears and, and then try to engage a target and successfully hit it and we're constantly trained on that and we, we do the best we can i don't know if well uh, a civilian ed, in that. ed pruda what do you say putting a civilian in that position. Whatever it was worked and didn't work last Friday. I think that we're really not far enough away from that incident because a lot of people are, have, it, there's nerves going here. I don't know the particulars of the timeline. I've, I've read, I've heard, uh, you know, I listened to some copies of audio transmissions. Sure. This was over in 20 minutes. This was over in probably 15 minutes. Um, someone in the school with a firearm responding to try and prevent what happened probably wouldn't have gotten there in time. Um, 911 call, dispatcher dispatches, police officers respond, they drive across town, they get there, they have to immediately make decisions. Do we go in? Do we stay out? What happened in Cheshire? They didn't go in. They didn't, you know, they had to wait. Yeah. Um, one dollar from every parent for every day their child is in school. One dollar from every citizen for every pupil that's in school per year. Mm -hmm. And you don't use it and put it into the general fund. You put it into security in the school. I have a five and nine year old granddaughter. After, and I heard, you know, I, I shoot spot television news, fires, accidents, homicides. I respond. I sell that to TV stations. So I've seen evil all over the place. What I'm trying to say is this, is that we can't stop evil. I think that if a perpetrator or a person thinking to commit a crime says there's people in that building with guns, he won't go there. Pro professor, I, I know that this, this is an argument you've, you've heard yeah. over, over the years. Yeah, it's, uh, the, there's no way of testing whether the presence of an armed person in the building has deterred an attack on that building because you're trying to prove a negative. The attack didn't happen. And uh, when you're dealing with somebody who is crazy and who is out to kill in the way that this guy was out to kill in the way that a lot of these, the, the, certainly in the mass shootings are out to kill, I can't really see anybody armed 
deterring them. Now, it's conceivable that a, a well-trained professional shooter in the building could have brought the guy down fast, but as you said, it's very difficult to train people and to maintain their level of training. It's not easy to kill people spontaneously. Uh, there was a study that showed that something like only 20 percent of infantry in World War II fired an aimed shot. It's not an easy thing to do, and uh, this guy had body armor as well. So we're talking about uh, a, a, an elementary school principal who's cool enough to step out <laughs> in the hall and knock him down with a headshot. Well, so I, yeah. I, so I, I think that what you have to, you can't, there are guys, if somebody's willing to die, you can't stop them. And I think what you have to focus on is two things. One is getting at the root cause of, of the kind of everyday violence that Mayor Segarra is talking about. Let's call it ordinary killing. And then you also have to try to minimize the odds of an extraordinary killing happening well, by and, and, minimizing. And, and, and you want to jump, by, just by, by, no. but yep, let me yep. finish. Let, no, me fin let me finish. Yep. By by minimizing the firepower that an ordinary uh, that 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 a, <laughs> that, a, that a person can bring to bear in a given situation. Now, for self-defense, what is it? The rule of three. Uh, you know, oh, was it uh, three shots, three feet? Uh, like that, you know, you don't need a 30 round clip for ordinary self-defense. If you minimize the, the quantity and kind of ammunition that is generally, of, uh, and, and of clips that are available, and, and, you cut down the yeah. firepower that the extraordinary killer can bring to bear on a situation. Well, and I know, Ed, you want to jump in, but, but Robert Crook, I mean, this is something that I know you've discussed in the past. One of the proposals that's going to be on the table at the state level and at the federal level is limiting the size of the clips, limiting the, the amount of ammunition someone can have at hand in that weapon at any one time. Why does it need to be 30 rounds? Why can't it be 10 rounds, 5 rounds? Why does it have to be 30 rounds? Well, let me tell you the best advertisement for that. Uh, if you watch the news, you saw the SWAT team arrive, the FBI arrive, ATF arrive, local police arrive, everybody arrived. What were they wearing? They were wearing bulletproof vests, they were carrying a a AK, uh, um, uh, yes. AR-15s, they, they had uh, Glocks on their hip. Mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly what, uh, what they look like. Now, from a, from a citizen's perspective, uh, this is an advertisement for the best tools available if you want to go for self-defense. But why should they be legal? Why, why, why on not? earth would a citizen be able to have them, uh, the same weaponry as the SWAT team that's trying to protect us? The mayor cigar is paying to try to protect the people of the city of Hartford. Because there be Cheshire uh, and other, we had one in Avon the other day, uh, yes, home invasions, home invasions. Normally more than one person, normally two or three people. Now, if, if, uh, if the police have an 18-round handgun, why shouldn't the civilian who's trying to defend his property and his life and his children have the same, have the same, uh, uh, the same ability? Mayor Cigar? If this country wants to make this country safer for its children and for its families, it has to come to a rational thinking so that hopefully we can be like other developed countries that don't have this problem. Professor spoke about the history. Add to that, and, 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 and mind you, that history involves when the West was, quote, trying to be one, uh, when people relied on guns for different motives because there wasn't an organized uh, police and security form force the way that we have it now. Uh, gentleman spoke about a timeline. Timeline didn't start 15 minutes before that incident. That timeline started when a woman was allowed to have, his mother was allowed to have these type of weapons. This timeline started when this young man was probably bombarded with a, commercial, a commercialization of violent images through, through arts, through music, through video games, through, through movies. Uh, so, so that timeline is a lot longer. We have a lot of work to do. And, 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 and I think we have to stop rationalizing uh, people's right to types of weapon that far exceed even our own law enforcement capacity to be able to, 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 to quell that amount of firepower. All, all of our panelists here, I, just very quickly, all of our panelists here, Senator Blumenthal, are talking about a, a long timeline, many, many lists of things, from violent video games to the way people are raised to the types of, of armaments. Um, how do you get at this entire list? I understand that right now you and your colleagues are engaged in trying to solve this problem at the president's direction. 
However, this is a very, very long list that's going to take an awful lot of money and quite a bit more than just a few firearms bans. A couple of quick points, John, and I think you've raised a critical question, as I said at the very beginning. The problem is multifaceted, and the solution also needs to be more than a simple, single solution. Let me begin by saying, you know, we've heard very different points of view tonight so far, and my philosophy is I want to reach out to Robert Crook and anyone else who has points of view that may be different from my own, including organizations, and you're right that the NRA will be holding a press conference tomorrow. We need to begin a national discussion or conversation, but we do need also action. We have a moment, a really historic opportunity, and we need to seize it now because the country is ready for it, indeed demands it. So I think there will be a set of proposals to answer your question that address a number of these very, very profound concerns, mental health, which we haven't really discussed, the background checks that relate to mental health because we need to keep these guns, whatever kind it is, out of the hands of people who are deranged or f full of the kinds of troubles that this young man had yeah. and caused him to ca kill people. One more point here that's very important. And quickly, if you would, sir, yes. Law enforcement is very much in favor of these rational and sensible measures to stop gun violence. And the reason is they're often at the other end of an assault weapon. They are often outgunned by the criminals. And the state police, some of them told me that the normal body armor that they would wear, the normal arms that they would carry, would not be the equivalent of what Lanza had when he went into that building. And so mm -hmm. I don't believe that people ought to have all of the armament that is available to public safety officers. Well, I, There's I, I, no equivalency. I, I, I want to give out the phone number so that people can join our conversation. It's 1-800-842-2788. 1-800-842-2788. And we did have a question. I believe it's from Dave in West Hartford about uh, the mental health issue. Dave, where, where are you? I'm just going to come down here and I'll pass you the microphone. Good. Well, my question revolves around the, the mental health industry. The past four mass shootings, as terrible as they were, were done by deranged individuals. And the main focus now is on gun control. If we look back to Aurora, Colorado, there were five movie theaters closer to that person's apartment. But he chose to go to the one further away where there was a sign posted that no guns were allowed inside of the movie theater. Exactly. So the focus is right on gun control, but we really need to look at the events that led up to that. And Mr. Blumenthal, you yourself had said, we can't touch the First Amendment, and other people are really touchy on the Second Amendment. First Amendment allowed this boy to watch the movies, to play the games, and have all of these events leading up to the tragedy in Sandy Hook. Why is that not addressed as much as the Second Amendment? Well, and what I might do is, I, let me put that to Superintendent, uh, just because I, I feel as though this is a, a long-running issue. This is an education issue. This is, a, mm -hmm. this is a, an issue of our society more than just what we're talking about here. Maybe you can address some of these things. Well, in our schools, obviously, we, we think a lot about safety and security, and we've talked before that we, we do the drills and we are preventing. But, you know, this, the, our goal and our mission is to educate. One of the things that we are educating, K through 12, definitely, is how our young people are learning to deal with conflict. They're learning how to address differences. They're learning how to be respectful of one another. They're learning how to deal with conflict, differences of opinions. The accessibility of firearms is, is of great concern. Um, it's in amazing how much time in the educational day, school in operation, is relegated for administrators and professionals doing investigations on reports that kids are making about one another and so on. And all of those things have to be taken seriously and our partnerships with the law enforcement community are very, very important to us and incredible. So what are we looking at? What, are our, what is our role in it? And part of our role is to work with students who exhibit 
other kinds of differences. As I look over our student population and I hear the reports from the principals of 20 schools mm. across the state in the past few days, beginning to really focus on students who are different and students who have needs, are they being met? And I think that if we think about preventing, mm. we're talking about doors and bars and buzzers and cameras and all of those things, we also have to think very seriously about are we kindly looking at kids that have differences and allowing those differences but really not addressing those differences. I, I want to go to a question uh, from one of our, our uh, viewers and listeners. Sarah is in Ellington. Hi, Sarah. Sarah, go ahead, you're on the air. Sarah, hopefully we'll get to Sarah. This, this, this happens on the radio sometimes well, too. Ed, I know you want to jump in. I, I, I gotta pipe in here. I saw you moving around like you wanna pipe to in. To the superintendent of schools. Correct me if I'm wrong because this happened very close to home. A mother calls the school psychologist because the child is demonstrating issues, stress, anxiety. The school psychologist says to the mother, oh well, if it doesn't have anything to do with the school, that's not something that we can get involved in. That's, that's a factual situation that I'm aware of. And here's what I wanted to say. First of all, professor, 20% of the people aimed? Yeah. March. 1968, the headline, the, the article said, Marines marksmanship impresses the enemy. I learned how to shoot at the Capital City Rifle Club on Jordan Lane in Wethersfield at nine years old. Marksman, pro marksman, marksman, first class sharpshooter. 10 years later, t one month after my 19th birthday in a rice paddy, or really it was up on a mountaintop, I was able to fulfill my mission because I knew how to shoot and I knew firearms. Senator Blumenthal, here's the problem. It needs to be, gun violence needs to be a federal crime. The federal government needs to throw these people in jail who illegally discharge a firearm in a violent manner. Our court system in Connecticut is broke. You've got more returnees from prison in Hartford who are obtaining firearms and going back to the old ways you want to lobby somebody, lobby the governor, Governor Malloy, to put the evil people back in the penitentiary and keep them there. The two people in Cheshire, we had them there. Well, let's, let, let's go to a quick I'm, response I, from I'm Senator not, Blumenthal. I, I, I appreciate it. Senator Blumenthal, very quickly, if you would, I'd like you to respond to it. There has to be a federal response, and we need it because many of the guns that are used on the streets of Hartford, maybe not in this instance in Newtown, but many others, come from other states. It's a problem that spans state borders and we do need federal solutions. I agree with you completely. And that's why I'm working as hard as I am, reaching out to both sides. And by the way, both sides of the aisle. There's nothing Republican or Democrat about public safety. We really have to begin this conversation in good faith and try to enlist as much as possible. But let me just say one last point here, sure. which is, again, I'm hearing from many people across the country that their views have changed. And no right in the Constitution is absolute. The Supreme Court has spoken on the First Amendment that video games cannot be banned under some circumstances. The Supreme Court has spoken about the D.C. law restricting certain kinds of sales of weapons in the Heller case that there are limits to what government can do. But sensible, reasonable regulations at the federal level certainly are not only possible, but necessary. I, I want to find Mary Garrett, who's in our audience. Mary? Okay, Mary, I'll come find you. I know Robert Crook, you wanted to jump in while I go uh, get the microphone to Mary. Did you want to jump into the conversation? Yeah. Uh, Attorney General, uh, U.S. Attorney General Holder came down to New Haven a couple of weeks ago, and he uh, said he was going to initiate uh, Project Longevity which is a program to uh, get all the gangs together, uh, not get the gangs together, but get a gang together, let them talk, give them the carrot and the stick. If they, if they use firearms within that gang, then they would get the stick, and the whole gang would get the stick in one way or the other. 
This is the first, I've been, I've been lobbying this issue and other issues for about 32 years now. Uh, this is the first time, other than what the Coalition of Connecticut Sportsmen did some years ago, uh, that I have seen anybody attack gangs, gang warfare in the towns. And let's be honest, read the paper. Everybody who's arrested with a gun in the big cities are e either arrested for felon in possession or they're arrested for uh, uh, carrying a handgun without a permit. The 179,000 pistol permit holders are not arrested. So it isn't our problem, it's a problem within the inner city and I think holders, holders got the right, the right method and the right uh, timing to do something about it. In, in wait, that, Mayor, Mayor on, Cigar, wait, I, no, I want to go to Mayor Cigar. Mayor Cigar, quickly. It's coming well, to your it's, city, it's, too. It's, it's not what Project Longevity is. It's a lot yeah. more complicated than that, and it's a lot more inclusive and involved in that. But I just, I just want to say that, um, uh, just very quickly, we are doing, it's, it's, it's a big issue with a lot of different components, and hopefully intelligent people from the community and from the respective disciplines understanding that it's a multi-systems approach that needs to be explored for dealing with the mental health issues, with the uh, school issues, with the weapons issue, with the state issues versus the federal issues. It's gonna take a lot of people coming together. Good sign is that the issue has now been moved from a small group of politicians and a small group of interests to the broader American society. And I think that's, that's one big important step that's happened. It's happened with other civil rights issues, and now it's starting to happen with gun control and issues around guns in our country, and that's a good thing, because hopefully things will change and change for the better. We, we want to move on to another question from our audience, and uh, <coughs> Mary's here. Hi, what's Hello. your question? Um, my question is regarding the many loopholes that exist. There are loopholes as far as being able to obtain weapons via gun shows, they, whereas I as a private citizen can sell a weapon to someone and there's no license there because I don't own a gu gun shop. There's the internet and other ways that people obtain these weapons. They're not necessarily, as far as I know, breaking the law. How are we going to, as a nation, not just as a state of Connecticut, close those loopholes because as we sit here and talk about, you know, people who have mental illness, you know, I actually sort of feel a little bit sad for them because not every killer out there, and I would argue the majority of them, probably are not truly suffering from mental illness. We put them under that umbrella because anyone that commits these crimes, there's something wrong with them morally, if nothing else. So how are we going to federally do this and the other part of that is the am ammunition if we know that people are purchasing l large stockpiles of weapons and ammo that should be a red flag well, well let me go to somebody who's sitting behind us here uh, beth by is a state senator and i know uh first of all welcome to our show thanks, thanks for being here thanks uh you you are working on some legislation at the state level right now yes. what can you tell us about it yes and it's uh, there's some legislation that senator looney has proposed to get just at this ammunition issue is that Right now, anyone who wants can buy ammunition. If we made, if we made it so you, if you bought ammunition, there's a record of it, and also that you have to own a gun. You know, so that, that would really cut down, I think, on some of the crime that we've been talking about tonight. So I think the shift, I think we have to close the loopholes, which uh, I have some legislation that hopefully will do that, but we also need to deal with the issue of ammunition and tracking those sales as well. H how do we deal with some of the, the mental health issues at the state level? We're dealing with budget cuts here. Uh, we're going to try to help people who need the help, but at the same point, we're cutting back on mental health services in part because of a big budget deficit. I, I think there's a huge problem there, and I think it's, it's penny wise and pound foolish. I think uh, the nonprofits do this work have been underfunded for years, and uh, I work with many families in my town who are struggling to get the mental health care they need for their adolescents and fighting tooth and nail. And these are parents who are lawyers and know how to fight. There are a lot of kids being left behind and not getting the care we need. So, so it is 
multifaceted, but a big part of this issue is also gun control. I, I'm wondering, Professor, if you could just quickly jump in and, and talk a bit more about the loopholes that Mary was asking about, how, how, we, how we got to a place in which certain things are legal in certain states, certain firearms are able to be modified so that they can be sold in, in one state versus another. How did we get to this particular place? Well, it's, uh, you know, uh, guns, are, guns have always been private property. Uh, and the laws of private property in this country are, for good reason, very, uh, very liberal. And it was, it, it's only periodically that we've uh, focused on the need to control uh, gun sales as such. Uh, 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 that, that's really, a, there have been other forms of gun control that have existed in this country in the past, but the gun sale business was uh, something that was, that's uh, fairly recent. And it was restricted uh, by compromises that were made when the legislation was passed. To exempt, uh, to exempt private sales, person-to-person uh, -person sales. And the arguments that sometimes are presented, you know, can a father give his son a, uh, a weapon and so on, it's just something that was, uh, that was left open that, uh, that uh, needs, to be, uh, needs to be closed. Uh, if I could just follow up, and it's, again, I'm a, I'm a cultural historian, right, so I've got to <coughs> talk about culture. The, w the way we think about guns, when we think about guns as ordinary property, we're making a serious mistake because it's not ordinary property. It's a, a, a gun is, and you have to respect, you have to respect the gun for what it is and what it is designed to do. Not everybody uses guns to kill. They use it for all kinds of purposes, but it, it, it was designed to kill people and animals. And whatever, whatever uh, ethic of use you have for that tool has to take account of the lethality of the tool. And uh, choices that you make can make guns more lethal. And I, I think that the discussion we want to have is, is, uh, is in establishing a reasonable notion of, of weapons policy. What, what actually is reasonable? What's a reasonable scale of firepower for personal self-defense in the kinds of situations in which people ordinarily find themselves? Uh, to what extent does the individual have to be, a, be prepared like a cop to f to, for an extraordinary moment of violence? And uh, what kinds of, it, 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 I, this is about, I, I, know the, I know the problem with defining what an assault weapon is. I understand how that works. Uh, and I understand the difference between automatic and semi-automatic. And so there's certain kinds of ammunition that are more lethal than others. Have a discussion about how lethal ammunition has to be and, and what kinds of restrictions, if any, what? should be put on certain kinds of ammunition. I, uh, Ed or Robert, Ed, go ahead. Okay, first of all, to Mary, you had a question, you talked about people selling guns. Anyone in the state of Connecticut who has a legally possessed handgun cannot transfer ownership to anyone else unless that person has either an eligibility certificate or a permit to carry, you must call the Department of Public Safety, you must obtain an authorization number, giving them all of the information regarding the transfer. And I do this all the time, John. People call me, people email me, people ask me questions, they ask our organization questions. Sure. But it's Mary sitting here in an audience tonight, and I didn't want her to leave yeah. thinking that, you know, even a father giving a firearm yeah. to a son has to complete the DPS-3, has to get the authorization number, has to go through the process. And wait, and yeah. wait. Yeah. You know, well, I, quickly, Mayor Cigar, just jump in here. because I, I yep. The only problem is the 600,000 weapons a year that are stolen from homes. Stolen from homes. That's correct. Well, uh, go ahead, Robert, quickly. Yeah, you we, jump have, in? we just passed a law just recently, uh, mandatory reporting of stolen firearms. Right. So uh, that takes care of that situation. We, we operate by the law and we have to enforce the law. <coughs> Secondly, uh, if you buy a rifle or a shotgun in this state, you've got to go through the instant check every time that you buy it. And it goes in a record. It goes in what they call a bound book. And it's on the computers. I mean, we know who's buying the guns. BAT, uh, ATF knows who's buying the guns. There is no loophole except for one, and that's a private sale. That's a private sale. If I sell Ed a gun, uh, and, and most people are reasonable 
in, in that they investigate the guy or they, they, they check him out who they're selling the gun to. Well, I, I want to go to another phone call. I, get, <coughs> I, I, I just quickly want to get, get to a phone, phone call. call. A lot of people I are understand. listening around the state. We I, need to do this again and again amen. and again and again because one hour is not long enough. Absolutely, the and that's why i got to get to Stephen that's Franklin. It. Stephen Franklin, go ahead. You're on the air. And of course, Steve's watching Hi, television. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I've been wanting to call in on this issue. Um, I am a lifetime NRA member, and I disagree with a lot of uh, their uh, very restrictive stand at this point in time. But we have, we have a lot of things to consider here. Um, there are laws that need to be put in place that restrict uh, the weapons that the young man used in Newtown. And they need to be in place so that the guns that are sold can't slip by the loopholes that are in the laws. The other thing is, the gun shows, private sales, should all be set up so that people are checked before they purchase guns. Now, I enjoy guns and I respect guns as much as many of my colleagues and friends around the country. I shoot competitively. I shoot uh, at a club. I used to hunt. Uh, but I never used an assault rifle, and I don't think many hunters do. However, even if the laws are put in place tomorrow, and let's remember that what Adam Lanza did was an illegal act. He stole guns to do what he did. Yes. If the law, good laws, are put in place tomorrow, it won't stop what's happening for a lot of years. And, and it won't, and it won't Steve, and thank you very much for your, for your phone call. Of, it's not going to stop things for a lot of years. We saw Robert Crook just in the last couple of days. When, when this event happened, we heard reports of people going and buying up weapons like this off the shelves as quickly as possible because, in part, people are worried that people who want these guns are worried that they're going to be illegal a couple months from now. Uh, he's making a good point that this is going to take some wi a while to do. That being said, when, when, when you see reports of that, one question is, what is the attraction? And, and maybe to the professor's point, why this level of lethality? Why is this the type of gun that we need to have to, say, be a sportsman? Sportsman's right in the title of your organization. Why does a sportsman need this particular high-powered high rifle with uh, uh, 30 uh, rounds right there in the magazine? Well, if you go out to the clubs, you'll see that probably uh, a, a high majority of the, of the rifles being used by both junior teams and senior teams and just shooters in general are uh, AR-15s or so something similar. Uh, but, but why do they have to be? Why, why, is, why does that have to be commercially available for people to use? Because they're semi-automatics. They are no different than a gun that I own. It's a 1905 uh, uh, Remington Model 5 30, 30, uh, 35 caliber. It's a big gun. This was made in 1905. So when we're talking about semi-automatic rifles, they're nothing new. They're absolutely nothing new. I, you know, and if they're a semi-automatic rifle, they should be able to be purchased by anybody. Is it Superintendent Saccone, are you going to jump in? Yes, thank you. Um, just in terms of the accessibility and your question related to the loopholes and other purchases, the issue that we're seeing in the schools um, with more and more guns being available and more powerful guns being available, even though we have urban schools where so much destruction is caused by simple handguns and homemade guns and <coughs> guns that are altered, is the accessibility to students. And when we have an issue, a simple issue of two students indicating someone in the school or perhaps someone on the outside of the school has made a threat when we call the law enforcement community in, one of the single biggest issues of discussion and investigation is accessibility. Do they really have accessibility to these weapons? And when we find that that is so, there are swift things that happen. So when we have students that have struggles and differences and problems, um, the market being flooded, the neighborhoods being flooded. Mayor, you spoke earlier today about 
um, the old-fashioned homemade zip gun or whatever, which was just one shot, but it certainly was, was dangerous, would flood a neighborhood. It's that level of accessibility that we have to control, and that's what schools are dealing with. And when we identify students, and I do want to, before I jump out of my skin here, <laughs> just address your concern about the level of responsiveness of the schools. I can only tell you that schools work very hard to identify and flag uh, 17 schools that I have right now that are serving high school populations each have a school psychologist. That's a very rare indeed and a very disappointing response that there's nothing we can do if it doesn't affect the school. We know that what's going on at home and what students are dealing with in their lives certainly affects the school. Schools are swift to contact mobile psychiatric services and if we can't give them the service, we get them to the service. I, I want to quickly look at Marjorie's in Bristol and Marjorie, please go ahead. You're on the air. Marjorie, go ahead. We're running low on time, so Robert Crook, I know you want to jump in. Yeah, let me tell you about a, a bill that we passed uh, about 19, 1998, somewhere around there. Uh, it was a gun trafficking task force bill. Uh, and, and we lobbied very, very hard to get the $500,000 to the uh, state police in order to implement this. And the idea was they would put people on the street looking for these uh, trunk sales of firearms. Uh, the first year they picked up 300 and some guns. The second year they were told not to do it anymore. Uh, and so they canceled out the money. We <coughs> got the money back about a year later. Uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety, and this is in writing, the Commissioner of Public Safety at that time said, uh, we're not spending the money, we ha uh, we're putting it into other stuff because there's no problem on the streets. Mm. Now, in this writing. Is in writing. Now, uh, our, uh, now this, is our, this is our state working. There's no problem on the streets. So what, what uh, Mayor, Mayor Cigar is saying and what, what you're saying about Bridgeport obviously doesn't apply according to this Commissioner of Public Safety. Well, in, in, uh, Senator Blumenthal, I'm going to give you the last word, and I'm sorry, I only have about 15 seconds. <clears throat> well, there is a problem on the streets. I think everybody knows it now. There's a problem in the small towns and the big towns, and Newtown will forever, for better or worse, stand as a symbol. Newtown United is an organization of citizens that want to <clears throat> do something about it, and they reflect a growing sense of outrage and, and, and I think, and I think we Senator, we're, we're all feeling that outrage today. And one thing I think we can all agree with, we should have more conversations like this, and we will in the future here on CPTV and WNPR. Thank you all very much for being here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.